anyway, so, uh, well, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I mean, Yvonne Choquebrua is a very important person in my own life, my own scientific life. She, uh, in fact, the first time I met, I met her was uh, uh, after my PhD thesis when I, I remember that we had discussions about my proof of global uh, stability for nonlinear wave equations in, in uh, higher dimensions, and she quipped uncharacteristically, because she was always extremely nice, but uncharacteristically, I remember she quipped that, well, in higher dimensions, I could have done it too, she, she said. And, but then uh, she was extremely encouraging, and we had long conversations, and uh, I mean, she's one of the, <coughs> I have one of the nicest memories of any, anybody, uh, any mathematician in the world, really. Uh, so. Uh, it's amazing that she got to be a hundred. I, I wish we could also have had here and talk to her, but unfortunately a hundred is a bit too much maybe. In any case, uh, uh, this is work that my talk is dedicated to her. So uh, first of all, let me, I guess I have to take this. So. Uh, uh, so here is a plan of the talk. So <coughs> this is an ACTA paper that uh, I will talk about. I, as, as I mentioned, she had a previous paper, which was uh, in contra and was a short one. Uh, I will follow a little bit uh, Christodoulos. Uh, Christodoulos has uh, a paper, a recent paper in 2022, where she talks about her work, about this, uh, exactly about this, about the ACTA paper. Uh, and. Uh, I talk about uh, uh, something very uh, important in in in, uh, in in this work in the ACTA paper, which is uh, the representation formula, the kirchhoff sobolev type formulas. I talk about resistance results based on the energy methods uh, and the bounded delta theorem, kirchhoff sobolev and the breakdown criterion, uh, the vector field method. Null conditions and stability of Minkowski, uh, other global stability results, formation of trapped surfaces. I, if I have a chance, uh, I might have to skip, I'm, I'm sure that I'll skip many of the topics at the end. Uh, instability of naked singularity, care stability, so this is a recent result with, with Jeremy. Uh, instability of the Cauchy horizon, rigidity of smooth stationary solutions. But I'm sure that I will not be able to do any, uh, the whole thing. So. Uh, Let's, uh, let's start first of all uh, with her paper. So this uh, concerns <laughs> the Einstein equation. So this is Einstein equations in general, but she was, uh, she was interested in the vacuum case. So she took the simplest case uh, in, in, the, in that uh, 1952 paper. Uh, so these are the Einstein equations. So Ricci curvature J equal to zero. Uh, she introduced what she called isothermal coordinates. We call them harmonic coordinates, or I prefer to call them wave coordinates because they solve a wave equation, but anyway, this is a matter of taste. And by the way, these were used by Einstein in 1912. But in the linear case? No. In the exact case, in Einstein's notebook in 1912, he introduces isothermal coordinates, so he discussed with mathematicians and he knew they existed. I see, okay, so... I remark, it's not the longer... Okay, okay, well, that's even, then it's even earlier, right? <laughs> And, uh, it goes back to Einstein. That's, uh, it, it's even a better pedigree. For <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, uh, so uh, the Einstein equations in this kind of coordinates take uh, the form of a quasi-linear system of wave equations. And for some reason, people like that because, uh, because uh, the wave equations are, of course, very familiar. Uh, I am, uh, <coughs> I mean, as you'll see, I'm not necessarily a partisan of uh, wave coordinates, but uh, th that's another story. But, of course, at that time, this was the most reasonable thing to do, and uh, obviously, uh, uh, you have to look at uh, the constrained initial data sets and constrained equations. Uh, and uh, there is, of course, the famous result uh, about uh, the fact that for every initial data set, you can construct a solutions of the Einstein equations. You can construct a maximum future global hyperbolic de development. This is work with Geroge. Uh, anyway, so this, uh, this is, uh, of course, the setting uh, of anything that is done in, 
in mathematical general relativity, let's say, uh, in that uh, uh, once you have this result, then the, the question that, uh, or the questions, because there are lots of them, uh, that I raised immediately is about the character of this uh, maximum future global hyperbolic development. I mean, is it, is it uh, uh, for example, complete? If it's not complete, what kind of singularities you can have, and so on and so forth. So everything now, everything that we do in mathematical general relativity is starting with this result and then uh, looking at, at the character of this maximal future global hyperbolic development. Right? All right, so, uh, so this is uh, the work that I'm talking about. So there is a work in 1950 in Contrandu, but, uh, right, so this is fe February 1950. And then uh, the big paper in ACTA, which appeared in 1952, Theorem d'existence pour certain système d'équation dérivé partiel non linéaire. So, uh, of course, what, what she does in this paper is uh, the first uh, local existence and uniqueness result for the Einstein equations in wave coordinates. So she picks up wave coordinates exactly because you get a system of quasi linear wave equations. Uh, but the method, I think very few people maybe know that the method is not the standard method that we use today for proving uh, local existence or even global existence, which is based on energy estimates. But she uses instead the kirchhoff sobolev representation formula. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about this. Uh, and uh, uh, if you, the kind of result that she proves, uh, she has a, a general result for systems of uh, uh, quasi-linear hyperbolic equations, as we shall see, but the applications to the Einstein equations requires uh, uh, some to go back to the uh, initial conditions uh, for the Einstein vacuum equation. And the kind of conditions that you need is that the metric should be in C5 and the second fundamental form in C4. Okay, that's uh, the result she gets. Uh, but uh, as you will see, uh, this is uh, not the main thing about this paper. The, I mean, the, the, the kind of exact regularity result is not too important. So uh, here is a quote from her paper. It seems to me that for the problems considered by the theory of relativity, it would be interesting to obtain under the minimal possible amount of assumptions an existence theorem easy to use, enabling one to find properties of the solutions that can be compared to the classical property of light waves. So she had a very good understanding of the Einstein equations are really hyperbolic, uh, and that, that the gravitational waves are real in particular, uh, which was debated, I guess, at the time. Even Einstein, I think, was confused about it. Uh, that can be compared with the classical properties of light waves and, and gravitational potentials, and to have formulas which can be a, an efficient uh, uh, method of calculating gravitational fields, at least approximately. And then she goes on to say, I have also built an Einstein space-time corresponding to non-analytic initial data. That's important because uh, analytic data really is trivial from our point of view. It's based on koshiko uh, And uh, so she <laughs> insists that this is in the non-analytic case, of course. That's, that's much more interesting. A sign on a space-like domain in such a way that it highlights a propagation character which is peculiar to relativistic gravitation. So this, uh, uh, and this of course brings us immediately to the, the actual construction, which is based on this Kirchhoff-Sobolev type formula, I'll, which I'll mention right now. So here, here is a Kirchhoff formula in four dimensions. So you have the uh, four-dimensional case with Minkowski metric, uh, and you are, are trying to solve uh, the ambition of I is equal to f, which is zero initial data for simplicity. And, uh, well, there is a Kirchhoff formula that uh, gives us a solution. Phi at the point P is expressed in terms of uh, the null cone starts from the, starting from the point P. So this is P, this is the light cone in Minkowski space. <laughs> and this representation formula takes place at the boundary of this domain. <laughs> uh, so here it is. Uh, phi is expressed as uh, an integral over n minus 1 of p, which is uh, exactly this null cone, uh, of a w, which is actually a very simple function that you, you can calculate. Uh, it's x, these are the spatial coordinates, x minus x bar at minus 1, where x is uh, cor what corresponds to the point p, and x bar corresponds to n minus. Uh, so f is, of course, the f uh, that you have here. And uh, the calculation that we all know 
is that uh, if you take Dalabesh and apply it to w times uh, the delta function on u uh, is given by this. You have a term involving a second derivative of u, a term involving first derivative of u, and then a term which involves just delta of u. So the uh, important thing is to solve this. To, I mean, these are the dangerous terms because obviously they involve derivatives. So you want to cancel this, at least these two, uh, which you, you do here by solving the iconal equation, m alpha beta d alpha of u d beta of u equal to zero. And then for this one, you solve a transport equation where L is really uh, this uh, vector field. So it's a vector field along, along the null con. And uh, uh, you, uh, you solve for W, you get exactly this. Uh, and you plug it in this, equa th this equation here, you get this zero, this zero, and this turns out to be exactly four pi times delta of V. Okay, so that's, that's a Kirchhoff formula. Everybody knows, we all love the Kirchhoff formula. It's a beautiful formula for, in, at least in C plus one dimension. In higher dimension, it becomes a bit more complicated, but uh, at least in C plus one dimension, it's very nice. So, uh, so then, uh, uh, if you want to generalize it now to an arbitrary manifold, arbitrary Lorentzian manifold, uh, so again, you want to take a point P and, and uh, the null con starting from the point P, then, then, then uh, uh, so this is the boundary of the past of the point P. So the past is here, the boundary is exactly this one, it's defined n minus one of P. You take uh, L, the null geodesic generator along, along this hypersurface here. Uh, and uh, you define this now second fundamental form, which is uh, for two vector fields, uh, what we call chi of x of y is just uh, dx of L y relative to the metric G. Uh, and then, uh, uh, of course, we all know that chi verifies a, an equation, it's called the Jacobi equation, which is that derivative of chi plus chi squared is uh, uh, the Riemann curvature tensor of the metric G evaluated along the direction L and L. So chi, of course, is a second uh, tensor, second order tensor. Uh, you can take its trace and you get the famous Raichaduri equation, which is a d over ds of trace chi, plus a half trace chi squared plus uh, chi hat. So this is a traceless part of chi, is equal to Ricci. And of course, for an Einstein metric, Ricci is equal to zero. Therefore, you get zero on this side, right? So, so this is true for uh, Einstein vacuum equations. So, uh, so then uh, uh, you want to solve the uh, wave equation, right? Using this, uh, what is called the Kirchhoff-Sobolev, uh, sorry, Kirchhoff-Hadamar and Sobolev later, uh, afterwards. But let's, uh, let's see what that means. You, you solve the same equation with, with zero initial data on a space-like hypersurface, sigma zero. And uh, uh, you look Again, for uh, essentially the same, you, you try to do the same calculation. It has, it, in other words, you take a D'Alembert and apply it to a W times delta of U, where you solve the iconal equation. So again, this corresponds to the metric G. Obviously, you want to take, well, you want to take U to be zero along this. Uh, and uh, uh, you do exactly the same calculation. Uh, so you, you are going to get the term involving the delta prime of W will be zero because you may you pick up U to verify this equation. And you get the second term involving delta prime to be zero because, uh, because you want uh, W to verify this equation uh, with initial data obviously at the point P. And, uh, and then, well, the, in the calculation now you get, uh, you get this term, but now you get a more complicated term, which you don't see in the flat case which involves, it's another term, which involves now second derivative of this trace chi that we just saw before, right? And uh, then there is just delta of u uh, on this side. So, uh, so the, the consequence of this calculation is that uh, you, you can uh, rep represent the solution phi of this equation uh, in this formula. So four pi times phi evaluated at the point P here is an integral of W uh, times F along this null hypersurface, plus an error term, which is also integrated along the null hypersurface, but it's an error term which involves, uh, which involves the phi, the original phi, right? 
and uh, it may involve a lot of derivatives of trace chi, two derivatives in fact, and many other terms here. So th this, this actually formula is a, a lot more complicated, but in principle, uh, you see that it depends on two derivatives of trace chi. That's the most important thing. Now, uh, what Hadamard did in 1932, so this is a famous paper, in which uh, he, he goes on, uh, he was not happy with this, uh, this term here, uh, and uh, in fact, using an infinite number of transport equations, he's able to get rid completely of this type of term. So at the end of the day, you just get this, this, uh, the, the standard representation formula. Of course, the problem with this is that uh, that, that required infinitely many derivatives of the metric. So you, you really need a, a smooth, absolutely smooth metric. And of course, the possibilities of applying it to a nonlinear equation where g depends on phi itself would be completely lost. Right? So the great observation of Sobolev in 1936 is that uh, you can, if you stop here, right? So uh, the important point is that you don't lose derivative in this formula. You represent phi in terms of an integral of phi with some, uh, some terms which depend on the metric. Uh, this is good enough for applications for the quasi-linear equation. So this was a, a main observation of uh, Sobolev in 1936. And that's the one that, uh, that uh, Yvonne uh, adopts. There were some other, I, I think by that time there were also ways of doing it using energy type estimates, but, but there was nothing very conclusive, at least uh, as far as she knew at the time. So anyway, so she adopts uh, the Sobolev uh, point of view. So here is what she does. Uh, so she, she is looking for a Kirchhoff-Sobolev type uh, formula for second linear systems. Uh, so this, think of it as linear equations where these are given. You have psi, but you have a system here. So S is, uh, you have uh, S, we can want up to something. Uh, first order terms and zero order terms and you, uh, something on the right hand side. And you try now to look, and this, what, th th this is what she does. By the way, I, I should say that uh, 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 what Sobolev did was only uh, uh, scalar equations. So in other words, uh, this would be the case where just you have just one species here, so you you have uh, you don't have you don't have a vector in S. Uh, so in other words, uh, uh, the representation formula would involve only one W here. Uh, and uh, anyway, so you look for solutions of this type. You you get the gain. You get uh, uh, that U in order uh, to get rid of the terms involving second derivative of U, as we ha as we have seen before you have to take uh, the diagonal equation. So U has to satisfy the diagonal equation. Uh, and WS, right, so this is uh, the, the term here, has to satisfy a system of transport equation now because you have more S's along this null hypersurface starting from point P, which takes into account, so this was uh, the new thing, uh, takes into account the sub-principal term. So uh, it's not enough to take into account the second order terms, as we usually know that you, you have to do. You also have to take, uh, you have to cancel also the sub-principal term. And uh, uh, so she, uh, she's able to do that. So I think the novelty of her approach is that she really treats a system, right? While uh, Sobolev only had a scalar equation. Uh, so she then applies the method to quasi-linear equations of this type without the d phi, but, but it's not such a big deal to include also d phi, it's just that you lose one more derivative if you do that. Uh, and the method requires two derivatives of trace chi, so we saw that from the representation formula. You need two derivatives of trace chi to be in an infinity, which means that the curvature, right, so if you go back to, to the equations that we had here, you see trace chi depends on uh, curvature, well, this one here, depends uh, on curvature on the right hand side. And therefore, uh, you, you need two derivatives of the curvature to be in an infinity, which means roughly that you need four derivatives of the metric. And in fact, uh, because of linearization, you need one more derivative. So that's, a, that's why she needs five derivatives of the metric and four derivatives of, sec of the second fundamental form. So that's, uh, that's roughly uh, what she does. Uh, which obviously was extremely innovative at the time, right? So, uh, of course, nowadays we do this, what, we, what is called the local existence theorem, we do it using energy estimates, not, 
not uh, the, the Sobole formula, but uh, I mean the Kirchhoff Sobole formula, but the Kirchhoff Sobole ha formula has a lot of advantages. And in fact, this is one of the things that we, we, we took advantage in, uh, uh, in, in my work with Rodiansky and then uh, an additional work by Kian Wang, uh, a, a student of mine, uh, where we, uh, we prove a result. Thibault has mentioned it. Uh, so the, the theorem uh, that, that we are proving using this kirchhoff sobolev type formula is that uh, uh, in order to, to make sense, uh, in order to, in order to, but anyway, we, we prove a, a breakdown criterion. So let me actually state what the result is. So assume that you have the space time starting up at, at uh, initial data. So this is the initial data and it's foliated by a time function. So sigma t are the leaf, <coughs> leaves of the time function. And also assume that, uh, that sigma t is maximal. So this is the kind of gauge condition that you are allowed to put. Or it's CMC, uh, in other words, constant mean curvature. Then the, the space time uh, can be continued past t star. So assume that uh, we can go up to some time t star here. And uh, so this is the continuation criteria. Uh, you show that the space-time can be continued past t equal to t star, provided that the integral from 0 to t star of this quantity here is less than infinity. So k is a second fundamental form on, on the leaves of this foliation. And n is a so-called lapse function that you, you see it here. So n is, so in the representation of the metric uh, in terms of t and, and coordinates x1, x2, x3, this uh, n is a lapse function. So th this is what you need in order to show that the solution can be continued, right? Now, uh, I mean, try to compare this with uh, Bill Katomaida for the Euler equation. It's uh, sort of very similar. Uh, it's, uh, in other words, it shows that uh, you need first derivative of, uh, of uh, the metric uh, in an infinity, but only certain first derivative of the metric are needed. You don't need everything. Just like in the Bill Katomaida, you need just, uh, you need just uh, the curl of, uh, of u of the velocity. Okay, so so that's a, that's a statement. Uh, the proof I, I'm going to go very fast over it, uh, but uh, it it has three uh, three important steps. Uh, the first one is just energy estimates. In other words, no representation formula, and you show that uh, if the condition is verified, the con the, our, our condition uh, that we had on the last slide is verified then you can show that the curvature is bounded in L2. So this is just a standard energy estimates, nothing, uh, no big deal about it. The second point is also not much more complicated. You can take higher derivative estimates. So you can show that you, go, you can control also uh, derivative of all order of the Riemann. So this is the Riemann curvature tensor. But uh, in order to do now, uh, I mean, everybody knows that when you start taking derivatives of the equations, you get other, ter other kind of terms. You cannot do it just in terms of this. So you need now curvature in L infinity in order to conclude that you estimate higher derivatives. And then uh, uh, the, the most important part of the proof is this one, to show that if star is verified, in other words, the original condition is verified, and you have bounds for L2 of the curvature, uh, then you also can estimate the L infinity norm of the curvature. And then obviously you can, you can close the whole thing. So this is the hard part. The hard part is to prove this. And it's based on a kirchhoff sobolev parametric, just like, uh, like uh, Yvonne did. Uh, you take the ambition. It's slightly more geometric than, than, than what she did, but because you have to be very careful which terms come in, in the representation formula. But uh, uh, roughly, it goes like this. You can show that the Riemann curvature tensor for Einstein metric verifies an equation of this type. The ambition applied to the Riemann curvature is a product of Riemann curvature with itself, some combination of products linear combination of products. And then uh, you can uh, do a representation formula, which is very similar to what we've seen before. The Riemann curvature, but it's a representation formula for, for the Riemann curvature. So it's more geometric. So the Riemann curvature tensor is expressed in terms of uh, uh, an integral of uh, this term with a w, just like before, along uh, the, this null hypersurface, which uh, starts from p. And then you have the error term, but again, the beauty is that the error term involves only the Riemann curvature tensor on the right hand side, multiplied by all sorts of other terms, which obviously you'll have to control. 
So the, the hard part now is to control this type of terms. So this, uh, this requires a lot of work. You show that, uh, that uh, in fact, the curvature flux, so this is, uh, uh, these are curvature flux represent L2 bounds on, on this uh, null hypersurface, uh, which emanates from P. So curvature flux of, um, uh, controls the radius of injectivity uh, uh, of this uh, null hypersurface. So these are, this is a null hypersurface that's, uh, starting at the point P. And of course, the danger here is that uh, you, if, if the radius of injectivity goes to zero, in other words, you don't have a lower bound for the radius of injectivity, then this uh, formula is useless, right? Because you do, it doesn't control anything. In order to extend the space-time, I need something where I control the radius of injectivity. So the main thing is how to control the radius of injectivity, and that's uh, what is done in a sequence of papers. I'm not going to go through it, uh, but I just want to tell you that this is a hard part. Uh, it involves uh, my paper, Suze Rodniansky, uh, on the causal geometry of Einstein vacuum space-time with finite curvature flux. In other words, the point is that I want to control, right, and maybe I should go back here. Uh, I want to control this radius of injectivity using only the curvature, the L2 norm of the curvature along the null hypersurface, right? So this is, this is what is said here. By the way, uh, flux means Bell Robinson or means? Well, yeah, you can define it in terms of Bell Robinson if you want. Yeah, sure, you can, you can use Bell Robinson to define the flux, yeah. But of course you don't need it, you can do it, you can do it by hand. Uh, so, uh, so uh, causal geometry of Einstein vacuum space-time with finite curvature flux. So, so that's the point. Here it's, you want to control the radius of injectivity. In particular, you, you have to control many other things, but in particular you want to control the radius of injectivity. Uh, in other words, you have to get a lower bound for the radius of injectivity. And then, you know, there are all these works here, uh, which have been simplified by a student of mine, uh, in this kind of work. There is also Kian Wang, which I mentioned earlier, also has done some work in this direction. Anyway, so that's, uh, I, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but I want to say that, that, that in, a, in a sense, this is intimately tied. These kind of results are intimately tied to what, uh, what Yvonne did in her work, but we, we obviously obtain a much sharper type of results. Uh, I should say that the, the result here, uh, which I mentioned, is scale invariant. So it's really a scale invariant norm. Uh, so it's, it's exactly right in terms of you know, what, what you want, because you always want to show that some scale invariant, as long as you control a scale invariant norm, you control the space time. Okay, so anyway, we go, we go back to, so let's go now to results based on energy estimates. So, so she did this, and I think very few people know that she did, I mean, pe people imagine that she did it uh, using energy estimates because every, nowadays everybody uses energy estimates for these sorts of things. Uh, but in reality, she used the Kirchhoff formula. Now, of course, the, the advantage of energy estimates, and I uh, try to explain it here, is that if I look at the same problem that she was interested in, so let's say in Minkowski space, the version of ISF with zero initial data, then uh, I can estimate one derivative of phi in L2 in terms of just f in L2, which is what you cannot do with a Kirchhoff formula. In Kirchhoff formula, you, you represent just the infinity norm of phi in terms of uh, the uh, f itself in, let's say, an infinity. Okay, so that's, that's clearly uh, much better. Uh, you gain a derivative, and uh, there were, uh, uh, there was these results prior to, uh, to the work of, uh, of Yvonne Choquebrois. Uh, there was a particular f uh, work of Friedrichs and Levy where they use energy estimates, uh, but they, they just do uh, relatively elementary things. They don't really solve the, the initial value problem. Schauder is the first one uh, that does it, but uh, apparently, if I, understand, if I understand correctly, Yvonne was not aware of that work. She did not find it. You know, Laura said you should look at papers of Schauder, and she found another she paper of Schauder, but not this one. Not this one. This. Right, okay. So that explains why. why. But I think it, I, I was working with energy yeah. estimates at the time, but he told her, right. continue I, your constructive method. Uh, yeah, and uh, I, I think I'm very happy that she did, because th th this is a different puts a different light on the whole subject, and that's also important, I think. Okay, so anyway, so, so there is a, uh, 
So these are results based on energy estimates, which I want to mention. So there is, of course, the work of Loray, uh, lectures on hyperbolic, uh, on hyperbolic equations. However, I understand that he had to use uh, a separation of eigenvalues. I mean, he, his result is not really the kind of result that is useful in applications. So actually, the, the result that we all uh, know and love and use is the one of Friedrichs in 1954, which is based on symmetric hyperbolic systems. This does not require anything about eigenvalues, right? So it's a, it's a much more uh, robust kind of method. Uh, there is a, uh, okay, so this is the work in 1954. Then there is a, the work of fischer mazen in 1972, which is optimal of what can be done using just energy estimates and Sobolev inequalities. Uh, so this is uh, for, uh, uh, you, you need uh, solar spaces on the initial data, so these are the initial conditions. You need S to be larger than 3 half plus 1. So beyond this, there is a work of uh, Rodniansky and myself in 2005, where you can go all the way to 2, so from 3 and a half plus 1 you go to 2, using three hats inequality. But three hats inequality for quasi-linear equations, that, that turns out to be somewhat complicated. Uh, and we use a wave coordinates, right? Okay, so this is a moment to say, please don't just look at wave coordinates. There are other ways of dealing with, with uh, the Einstein equation. And here is an example. Here we used, uh, uh, so we proved the bounded delta curvature conjecture, which is work done with uh, Ronianski and uh, Jeremy here in 2015, where we use a different, uh, a, a different, uh, we don't use wave coordinates. In fact, it's known that in wave coordinates, this result is sharp. Sorry, uh, this is, uh, in wave coordinates, th this result is sharp. And the reason is because the, wave, the null condition is not verified in, in wave coordinates. It's a weak null condition that is verified, and the weak null condition does not give you the best results. So in order to do this, you need it, we needed something else, uh, an entirely different approach, which is much more geometric, uh, in which the null condition is actually uh, obvious. Right? In fact, we use a young Mills type approach. Anyway, question. Uh, so this goes only to s equal to 2. It was a tough, it's a tough result to get, uh, but can you do better? Uh, the critical exponent is s is equal to 3 half. Uh, if you go to this exponent, you also prove a, a global result. So the, the, I mean, one obvious conjecture that you can make is that the, there should be a local existence result for small data in, in H3 half, uh, a result which would be global. Uh, but, and by the way, the, such results are, are true for equations which are semi-linear, like young Mills, geometric equations which are semi-linear, like say young Mills or wave maps. Uh, but uh, in, the case, in, uh, in the case of quasi-linear equations, you reach a very uh, serious problem, which I think I mentioned here. So this is uh, uh, the bounded L2 theorem, which is uh, this work with Jeremy and uh, Igor Ronyansky which is based on uh, uh, writing down the Einstein equations using a young mills type frame, uh, in which the null condition is, is obvious, right? So, so the important thing is that you see the null condition, right? And uh, then, uh, so uh, you can represent solutions of the wave equation, or just the wave equation for the metric G. You can represent it in terms of plane waves. So this is a plane wave representation where u, mega, u omega, so omega is an angular variable, u omega verifies a null condition, uh, it's verifies, sorry, the iconal equation, excuse me. And then uh, the crucial uh, part in proving such a theorem is to prove bilinear estimates for two uh, solutions of two types of uh, wave equation, in which only one, the, the important thing in the proof is that uh, only one uh, among the two uses uh, this representation formula. The problem is that the representation formula is not, is, not co is not exact. You have error terms, and the error terms are very hard to, to get. And in fact, there are four papers of Jeremy Seftel by himself in which he, uh, he just proves sharper estimates for these uh, error terms. Okay, so that's. Uh, so, so this work, uh, I'm going very fast over it, but obviously it took a long time. I mean, it takes a lot of pa pages, unfortunately. 
uh, it should be simplified. I mean, I, I hope that people really get back to it. For some reason, this, this is one of the, our works which has never been uh, taken out by other people. So I, I really would hope that people get interested in this. It should be simplified and, and improved and so on and so forth. Uh, the, the, the fundamental reason why you cannot be low L2 is because of the iconal equation. So uh, iconal equation requires, it's the iconal equation that requires two. So for example, if you have equation which are not quasi-linear, for which, in other words, the characteristics that we have here are characteristic in, in uh, the, the usual characteristics uh, in Minkowski space, then, uh, then uh, you, uh, you can go all the way to the critical exponent. So, so yeah, maybe this is important to say. So for semi-linear equations like young mills or wave maps or many others, you can go all, if they, they have to have a geometric structure, they have to satisfy the null condition in some sense, you can go to the critical exponent. You cannot, you, the reason you cannot go to the critical exponent here is because of this equation, because of the equal equation. The equal equation does not make sense below H2. We know that, uh, in other words, you cannot control the radius of injectivity of these null hypersurfaces uh, if you don't have curvature flux in L2 here. You cannot, there's nothing, there's no other quantity below curvature in L2 that really controls the radius of injectivity. So this is a major problem, in fact, because the hope is, we all know that Einstein equation is a wonderful equation. I mean, there's no reason why you should not be able to go to a critical exponent. So, uh, but unfortunately, uh, we, we don't have such a thing uh, yet. All right, so let me talk about stability of Minkowski space. So that's, uh, that's another thing in which, uh, in fact, Another topic uh, of I I that Yvonne was very interested in, and she was extremely encouraging at the time when uh, she knew that I was working uh, on this with Dimitrios Kistodoulou. Dimitrios Kistodoulou was also somebody that had a lot of contact with, uh, with Yvonne. Uh, so anyway, uh, uh, the, this is an important part of the story that maybe mo more people, mo most people don't know. Yvonne had a, a work in 1973, which uh, was called Une Théorème d'Instabilité pour Cetan Equation Hyperbolique Non Linéaire, and in which she shows that in linear theory, uh, relative to wave coordinates, so the problem was wave coordinates, in fact, she showed that uh, you get logarithmic divergences. So when you do the first, in other words, when you, you, you linearize the equations and you look at the first iterate, you get a logarithmic, the first non-trivial iterate, you get a log logarithmic divergence. And then, of course, she didn't follow it up, but she thought that this would lead to an explosion. And in fact, it doesn't lead to an explosion. Uh, and that, that uh, came out much later in the work of uh, Limblad and Limblad Rodniansky, uh, which was uh, global existence in the Einstein vacuum equations in wave coordinates. So even though in wave coordinates, you don't satisfy the null condition, which played a fundamental role in the proof of stability of Minkowski space, the second proof of stability of Minkowski space by Limba Rodniacki uh, uses steel wave coordinates, which makes the problem somewhat easier, but you don't get the optimal results, but nevertheless, you get a global existence result. And that's uh, because even though the null condition, which is uh, essential in the proof of stability of Minkowski space, even the null condition is not verified, there is another one, which is called the weak null condition, which was actually discovered by by Limblad and Onyanski, exactly in this paper. It's a weak null condition, right? Uh, so in fact, actually, uh, since Cecile mentioned it, so this equation, dt phi squared, does not satisfy the null condition. This is a terrible equation. Uh, but if you look at uh, equations like this, the ambition of phi is uh, phi times, uh, let's say phi t times psi t, and the ambition of psi is zero, this does not satisfy the null condition, but it satisfies what is called the weak null condition. And the weak null condition is good enough. Okay, so that, that's the observation uh, in these papers. And then, well, fortunately or unfortunately, everybody started to, to, to use uh, harmonic coordinates, wave coordinates. Uh, By the way, it, from the physics point of view, it's Spock who first understood that this null free, that infinity which creates logs, is a gauge effect. I mean, he, he, he okay. mastered these logs okay. because he, he loved harmonic coordinates, but he showed these are logs that you can factor out, and then the solution is good. And I, I, I remember that you told me something like this also when I was talking to you many, many years ago. Yeah. So who? who?
So Fock. This is, is Vladimir Fock. That, that we Fock. use that in when we compute. Okay, so so you can say that among physicists, it was, it was somewhat known already. All right. Okay. So in any case, uh, this is. Uh, I, I just want to go very fast over uh, sort of preliminary results. So the the, the result of uh, John started to look at long time existence results for quasi linear wave equation. Uh, I proved in my PhD thesis. I proved a, a, a global existence result in higher dimensions. And uh, I mean, that's the one that I mentioned earlier with Yvonne, that Yvonne sort of laughed at me at the time. I could have done that too, she said. <laughs> uh, but uh, but she, as I said, she was extremely encouraging. Uh, anyway, so uh, they so use uniform decay to derive long time existence result in, in sufficiently high dimensions. Uh, <coughs> the vector field method is the one that really uh, allowed, together with an R condition, Right, these two things here allowed us to go to 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 be able to actually uh, solve equations in three plus one dimensions globally in time. So that was needed in the the work with uh, Christodoulou. Uh, so the nonlinear gravitational stability of Minkowski space uh, is based on gauge choices. So gauge obviously played a very important role. You cannot use wave. We we didn't want to use wave coordinates exactly because of the work of Yvonne Chotebrua. Right, so the, the work of Yvonne Chogebrua really told us don't do wave coordinates, even though, well, it turned out in the end that one could use wave coordinates, but I think we were extremely lucky that we <laughs> didn't do is use wave coordinates because it allowed us to discover other things. And uh, so uh, flexible gauge shows it brings back the use of characteristics. So this is important. So uh, characteristics, of course, were used in the work of Yvonne Chogebrua. In the, in the works based on energy estimates, you don't need them, right? So local existence results using, using uh, energy estimates don't use characteristics. And I remember having long discussions with Fritz John at the time when he said that, in his opinion, the most important thing that happened in his lifetime was the fact that they got away from using characteristics, right? So they <laughs> and then, of course, within two years, we actually proved this result where we bring back the characteristics. And I kind of had sort of funny discussions with him about this. But I mean, of course, Fritz John was extremely uh, encouraging about what we did. But, uh, but uh, it, I still remember this as, as an, sort of an interesting historical fact that for them, for his generation, the fact that they got rid of characteristics was very important. Characteristics were ca kind of complicated in the proof of th this kind of existence for quasi-linear equations. So getting rid of them was very important. But, uh, but then we sort of brought them back in. Anyway, so there is, uh, I mentioned an Imbad Rodnianski result where they showed, in fact, that they can use still weak coordinate, weak, uh, not, sorry, wave coordinates. The reason is because there is, null condition is not verified. We thought that you need a null condition in order to be able to prove something in three plus one dimension. But instead, there is something which is called the weak null condition, which is, I, we just mentioned. And that's the one that they use. All right, so that's. Uh, anyway, here we are in dimension three plus one. Three plus one. In high dimensions, dimension, you don't need. Wave coordinates are fine, no? Yeah, correct. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> Any, if you go to high dimensions, there is no problem. Right. All right. So, uh, so here are some other global stability results. So there are in vacuum. So people have after our result. There are many other uh, results that were proved. This, this is a result with, with Niccolo, where we, we use sort of a, a different, different kind of uh, uh, geometric construction. Uh, but it was done only in the exterior of an Alcon. Uh, there is a Bieri result in 2008, also on, on vacuum, where she uses very, uh, very few uh, conditions, uh, in other words, asymptotic conditions of the initial data. And this was now improved quite dramatically by Shen. So this is, Shen is right here. So you can ask him about his result. It's a very nice result. Uh, then uh, with matter, if you look at the Einstein equations in, uh, with matter, there are also lots of results by Zipser, Le Flochma, Kian Wang, uh, Fajman, Judyush, Mulevich, Lindblad, Taylor, and so on and so forth. Right? So there, there are many, many other results which I don't have time to mention. Uh, the open question. Uh, that is connected in some sense with this observation of Shen that you, you, you need very little decay conditions at infinity is uh, that, uh, that one is there a scale invariant version of stability of Minkowski space that means can you go to 3 over 2 right so, so again the scaling exponent I recall is 3 over 2 
the question is, can you go to 3 over 2? Even though we know that once, that once you go below 2, you cannot solve the Iconal equation anymore. Okay? So there has to be something else which we don't understand. It's a fundamental question. It's probably one of the most important questions I think uh, we have in mathematical general relativity today is to be able to go to find a scaling invariant version of the stability of Minkowski space. If there is one, and if there is none, then presumably uh, you know, any kind of result that uh, <coughs> makes sense at the scaling invariant, uh, scale invariant norm should be understood. Uh, okay, so how much time do I still have? Uh, Twenty minutes. Okay. Yeah. All right. So here is another another kind of results uh, in mathematical general relativity, uh, which uh, uh, Yvonne, I'm sure that Yvonne liked. Uh, I mean, I know she liked because we talked about it. So there there was a break breakthrough result by Christodoulou in 2009 where he showed the formation of black holes in general relativity. Actually, not really black holes, but trapped surfaces. Um, there is a, a conjecture by Penrose that uh, if you have trapped surfaces, you, you will also have to have uh, a horizon. Uh, and, the, the, and there is a, the, you know, there is something about the cosmic censorship, uh, which uh, <laughs> can be formulated, but I'm not going to do it now, but, the, but, but in any case, it's not formation of, of black holes, rather, but the formation of trapped surfaces. So, uh, uh, the, the idea, so I'll, I'll just describe very fast. Uh, you, you start with initial conditions uh, on a Lycon. Uh, assume that, that uh, th this is a null constant starting from a point P, and assume that in the white part, everything is Minkowskian. Uh, right, so for example, here uh, in this picture, sorry, so th th this part is Minkowskian, all this part here, and the, the only part which is not Minkowskian is this region here. So, in other words, you set up initial conditions here, in, you set up zero flat initial conditions on this side, which corresponds to this part here. So, as I said, you have something flat on, on the interior of this uh, picture. So anyway, so you have you have flat initial data here. You have not you have non-trivial initial data here, and you show that under certain assumptions of the initial data, you form a trap surface here. So a trap surface, everybody, who, those who don't know what a trap surface is, is uh, something uh, a beautiful concept concept uh, this, which was introduced by Penrose. Uh, which ensures the following thing. So, see, in Minkowski space, if you start up with a sphere, you can have a light cone going out and a light cone going in. Right? So that's the standard situation in Minkowski space. Now, if I have a space-time which is sufficiently curved, something like this can happen, that, uh, that this one, this light cone, uh, which corresponds to this one here, it's still like this. But this other one is also... Uh, curving in, okay? So that would be uh, sort of a, a situation that cannot occur in Minkowski space, but can occur if you have a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, radiation. And that's, that's a situation that, uh, uh, so that, that's what basically uh, intuitively you should understand about the trap surface. So if I start, so okay, so those starts with certain initial data, which cannot be close to Minkowski space, because stability of Minkowski space tells you that you cannot form a trap surface. Right? So it has to be initial data which are suffi sufficiently large here, such that later on you form a trap surface. So, you, so in this picture, uh, you form a trap surface at this point. So he, his trap surface was isotropic. In other words, uh, the initial conditions that he had here were already uh, large in all directions. Uh, the, the other interesting result that we proved with uh, Luke and Rodniansky in 2014, is to show that, in fact, it suffices to, to take initial data which are large just in an angle, just in a small angle. So in this picture, everything is Minkowskian. Uh, you are taking initial data on this side, uh, concentrated in a small angle. And uh, you can show that under, under certain 
that there, there exists a large set of initial data here, uh, which uh, form a trap surface later, later on. So this was quite a uh, sort of interesting result because I would say it was kind of unexpected. Uh, you know, just one one suffices, right? And yeah. compact support. Com compact support, right? Yeah. So uh, there was another result of uh, Anne and Luke, uh, which shows that uh, trap surfaces in vacuum can form. Uh, uh, sorry, what is this? Actually, I'm confused. Uh, this, this is not Vacuum the right. Including radiation can form. Yeah, going from infinity, going all the, all the way from infinity. No, but but this result is more interesting than that. Any, anyway, let, let me let me uh, let me go to uh, instability of Nakan singularity. So this is a, a beautiful result that uh, is true only in the spherical asymmetric case, uh, which is roughly uh, it's sort of the, the, you have the same kind of picture here. <laughs> Uh, where Kistodoulou shows that in spherical symmetry uh, you can find initial data here uh, so this is on an outgoing characteristic uh, which is in s s small but in BV right so it, it, it has a very little regularity but in the BV norm whatever BV norm means in this context uh, it's sufficiently small <laughs> I mean it's very very small so it, anyway he finds he, he he, he proves the following result that if you have a naked singularity, a naked singularity, uh, uh, I guess it will take me some time to, to explain what a naked singularity is. Uh, the, the, the point is that uh, uh, the cosmic censorship conjecture, cosmic censorship conjecture says that, uh, that if you, uh, if you, uh, you have uh, singularities cannot occur outside a outside a, a, a horizon, an event horizon. So the the space time has to be uh, smooth uh, away from the uh, event horizon, and uh, the singularities, uh, if they occur, occur only inside the event horizon. Okay. Now a naked singularity will contradict this thing because a naked singularity would be a singularity which can be seen by, uh, by uh, everywhere in the space-time. So in particular, it can be seen by, in, in an asymptotically flat manifold, it can be seen by, by observers which are very, very far away. So this is, this is uh, a cosmic censorship conjecture tells you that such things cannot happen. Okay? Uh, and, uh, well, uh, in fact, what Kistodoulou did was to show that things like this can actually happen. So he has constructed naked singularity in the spherical symmetry case. So it's actually, it's not just, uh, it's Einstein equations plus uh, a scalar wave. So you need some kind of matter in order to make sense of this result. Uh, and uh, he shows that uh, uh, the, uh, First of all, that there exists naked singularity. So the, the, there exists uh, special solutions uh, which have this uh, unfortunate fact that you can see them from infinity. Uh, but he shows that uh, they are non-generic. In other words, you, you, if you have one like this, uh, you can always construct a perturbation here uh, such that uh, the, the singularity disappears. So th this, this perturbation has to be done in BV, so you have to show that the, the BV, the bounded variation of that perturbation, uh, you can construct, construct bounded variation uh, initial conditions on, on this part, uh, such that, such that uh, 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 an event horizon forms. So for every time you perturb this, you'll get an event horizon. So this is this is the, f the form of uh, cosmic censorship conjecture that exists today, tells you that generically you cannot have naked singularity. You cannot have singularities just in from, from infinity. So that's... Uh, anyway, uh, so there was... Uh, I guess I, I won't have much time to, to talk about this, but I'll just mention uh, the, the fact that uh, Christodoulou had a, a series of lecture, a, a series of papers uh, in which he proves this cosmic censorship conjecture uh, in the spheric asymmetric case. And there are some interesting recent results of Li Liu and An, 
where, uh, where they actually replace these uh, perturbations here, which are done in spherical symmetric case. They perturbations in, in, in they, they, they construct initial conditions uh, which uh, uh, are not spherical symmetric and such that an event horizon forms. Okay, so it it sort of extends the cosmic censorship conjecture. This cosmic censorship result of Christodoulou extends it in a in a in a non spherical symmetric case. I mean, I, I should say that the original solution is still spherical symmetric, but the perturbation is non spherical symmetric. So, uh, but I, maybe I shouldn't spend time on this. <laughs> okay, so let's go to the stability of care. So this is. I want to talk about recent work with, uh, with Jeremy and also with uh, Elena Georgi. Uh, and I'll finish with that. How much time do I say we have? Ten minutes. Okay, good. So, so this is uh, another topic which was very dear to uh, to Yvonne, uh, and she was very supportive, in fact, of of, the, of our efforts in this direction. So everybody knows the conjecture. Uh, so it's uh, uh, you have a, a family of solutions which are called the Kerr solution, right? Which are represented geometrically in this picture. Right? So you you have a region, uh, the black hole region, which is represented here, and uh, it was a boundary which is called a uh, which is called a horizon. Uh, R equal R plus, which you, R plus is something that you, you can determine uh, from, from uh, very simply from A and M. Uh, in other words, I am on a care <coughs> solution and uh, I can write down what R equal R plus is. And uh, uh, you take initial conditions, so I take initial conditions and make a small perturbations on, of the initial conditions uh, relative, uh, uh, the uh, perturbation relative to the original care solution. So I start with the care solution A and M, I perturb it, and I want to know what happens, right? So, so the, the conjecture is that uh, pertur perturbations of a given exterior KM express the perturbation is expressed on this hypersurface. This is a space like hypersurface. Uh, have maximal future developments converging to another care solution with different parameters AF and MF, right? And this should be true for any uh, a absolute value of A less than M. So the result which we have uh, is that, the, that it's actually true if uh, A over M is sufficiently small. So we, we, we don't have it in the full range of A less than M, but we do have uh, in perturbations of Schwarzschild. So when A is equal to zero, we get exactly Schwarzschild. So, so in particular, uh, Schwarzschild spacetime is stable. Uh, so there are there are many papers of this type. There is uh, uh, the main paper, which is Jeremy Seftel and myself in 2021. There are two papers uh, uh, on uh, GCM surfaces, which are uh, 2019, and there is another one for what we call GCM surfaces. So there are uh, sorry hypersurfaces. So there are surfaces and hypersurfaces. I'll show it in a picture in a moment uh, how, how that works. Uh, so this is Shen, uh, and uh, uh, there is another uh, important paper uh, by uh, in collaboration with Georgie, which appeared in 2022. So 2021, 2019, these are the two papers, 2022 Shen, and uh, 2022, this other one. So I want to talk a, li a little bit about the, the history of this problem. So in particular, I think it's extremely important to mention, I keep mentioning all the time, that the result obviously is important. Uh, stability of black holes is obviously an important, uh, an, an important uh, problem statement result now. Uh, and uh, uh, but lots of people have contributed to it, and that's important to emphasize. So, for example, but of course there was first of all discovery of the care solution. This is in 1963. Then there was a lo long period when many physicists. Um, have worked on it and they produced a lot of very interesting results concerning the linear mode stability of the Kerr family. So this is, you have to think about it that you linearize, you, you, you linearize the Einstein equations around the Kerr solution. A Kerr solution has certain symmetries. You use a symmetry to construct, uh, to construct uh, mode solutions, right? And then you try to prove some kind of stability of the modes. And this is already a difficult problem and it required uh, 
uh, required the contribution of lots of um, uh, physicists, mathematical physicists. So there is uh, the first work was in 1957 by uh, Reggie and Wheeler. Red uh, sorry? Red J. Red J. Okay, right, Italian. Okay. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Uh, I should know as a Romanian, I should be able to say that. Uh, Teukowski equation in 1973. Uh, so this was uh, uh, based on curvature perturbations. So th there is something called metric perturbations, in other words, where, where you look at linearization of the Einstein equations relative to the metric itself or uh, relative to the curvature. Uh, there is a Chandrasekhar transformation that connects metric perturbations with curvature perturbations. It's very important, uh, it plays a very important role in the story that I'm saying now. Uh, there is a work of Whiting, uh, which completes in a sense what has been done by physicists uh, concerning the linear mode stability. So he actually proved a very general result concerning linear mode stability for perturbations of care. Uh, and uh, there are some other more recent results by mathematicians, Anderson, Hefner and Whiting, which complete the result of Whiting. So, uh, Global stability of Minkowski space, I mentioned, so there is uh, 1993 uh, by Dul and myself. So th this introduces uh, the so-called vector field method, which plays a very important role now uh, in, in all these kind of results. The null condition, which I already mentioned. Uh, and uh, uh, so, sorry, I'm, yeah, okay, so I'm global stability of Minkowski space. Then the next uh, phase, so this is a phase that really belongs to mathematicians now. So it started with physicists, it uh, goes to mathematicians. So what the math mathematicians try to do is to get results which do not depend on modes. So they, 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 are, they are true for general solutions of, say, uh, linearized equations. So in, in particular, uh, in the case of uh, uh, A equals zero and uh, M different from zero, the first results were results on just a wave equation on a... So let, let me write it like this. So you, 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 you want to study this equation, the simplest possible equation, on a Kerr solution. In particular, already when a is equal to zero, this, is a, this, this was a hard problem and it took a long time for people to solve. I mean, it was solved for mode stability by physicists, but uh, in order to do something which uh, is done independent of uh, a mode decomposition, this took, uh, uh, this uh, led to the development of completely different methods done by, by mathematicians. So the most important names here are Sofer. Uh, so Sofer uh, played a major role in sort of changing. In fact, he is the one who, who uh, really brought in uh, methods based on so-called Moravec estimates. Originally, people were trying to do uh, things based on, like the physicists, based on on showing that this mode stability result can be uh, generalized to uh, sums of of modes, right? So, and that that turned out to be actually not very successful. <coughs> so, so so he played a very important role. And then there were results by Blue Sterbens, uh, Dafermos Rodiansky, Matsuola, Metcalf, Tataro Tohanianu. Then, uh, so this was for a equal to zero. So again, this is just a wave equation. Uh, uh, I mean, just this, this wave equation now for, for A different from zero, there were results by uh, Dafermos Rodiansky, Tataro Tohanianu. Anderson Blue is very important because that's a, kind of, uh, that, that's a kind of method that was introduced by them, which plays a, an important role in our work. And then, the, so this was just for the scalar wave equation. In other words, this equation here. Uh, there is, uh, there is a so-called spin two wave equations, which are much more relevant to the Einstein equations when you linearize the Einstein equations. These are called spin two wave equations. They are much more complicated. There is a so-called Teukowski type equation, which we already saw, in fact. And uh, so the, there were results now uh, that started more or less in 2016. There was the Fermos Holtzeg and Rodniansky uh, for uh, a robust decay for spin two wave equations when a is equal to zero. Uh, for a strictly less than m, I mean much less than m, there are results by Ma and the Fermos Holtziger Ronyansky. Uh, the results here uh, for the whole range are, uh, are results by these people. Anyway, uh, 
Th these are just for the way, so the results which I mentioned here are just for the wave equation. The results on, on linear stability, in other words, you take the full Einstein equations and you linearize them, uh, they involve many other complications. You d you, it's not enough to just solve the wave equations. You have to solve for components of the Einstein equations which are gauge dependent. So then the choice of gauge becomes essential, right? The, <coughs> the wave equation uh, does not see the gauge, the, the kind of wave equations that show up in this linearization don't see the gauge, but, uh, but the rest uh, does. Uh, okay, so the first uh, result uh, on the true uh, Einstein equations is our result with Jeremy Seftel in 2019. Uh, this was done under an assumption of polarization. Some people make a big deal out of this uh, polarization. In reality, uh, it played an important role only in a few places. I mean, in, in, uh, for most of, the, most of our proof of the stability depends very little on the polarization. It, it, uh, in fact, it, I mean, the, mo the, the main place where it, it plays a role is that uh, uh, Schwarzschild, uh, when you do the wave equations in Schwarzschild, is much simpler than doing the wave equations in care. So as a consequence, you want to keep you, you, you want to keep as close to Schwarzschild as you can possibly be in order to have to, to use a kind of uh, the kind of uh, technologies that we had at that time for Schwarzschild and we didn't quite have yet for care. So uh, anyway, so this was uh, uh, the result. There is another result uh, which actually uses a lot from our result without saying. Uh, this is a code I mentioned three data sets, uh, the Fermos, Holtzeg, and Taylor in 2022. Uh, then, uh, so this is, yeah. Uh, then uh, 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 we generalize the methods to Schwarzschild. We wanted to go to CARE. Uh, and uh, there are these papers here uh, on what we call GCM, uh, generally covariant modulated spheres. I'll mention in a, in a moment what, what this notion is. But these are certain constructions that play absolutely a, a fundamental role in, uh, in the stability uh, results. Yeah, I'm done. No, you're in negative time, but... Uh, I'm negative time. Your slide, but maybe if you want another slide to explain this. I, I, uh, yeah, okay. So the, 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 I wanted to finish with this one. Uh, uh, so uh, this is a picture. I mean, the, the, the picture which I will not be able to explain, but at least I can say, I can say something about this, uh, this GCM conditions. So I, I mentioned these three papers, uh, two papers with, with Jeremy and another paper with uh, of Shen, which is uh, uh, concerns. Uh, so this is a picture of the space time that you want to construct. Uh, so this one, you see the, the important of, of, of this sphere here is that it's chosen independent of the initial conditions. So, so this is, if you compare with what was done in stability of Minkowski space, that's the main new, the main new ingredient, that you construct a sphere, uh, which uh, uh, is a co-dimension to sphere, uh, which uh, you construct in, in, uh, uh, without direct information from the initial data. All the other results that were proved before were starting from the initial data. So this starts from, from infinity, so to speak, and, and then you construct sigma star, which is uh, the, the work of Shen, in fact. Uh, and then from it, you construct the rest of the space-time. So, so this is a crucial part of the space-time. Everything else is constructed relative to it. I, I, I won't have time to explain. Uh, but uh, 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 the, maybe I can, I can just end with, with the, the fact that uh, since th these spheres are, are constructed far away from the initial data, so the initial data are here in this picture, this, these are uh, the initial data which are given, th these, things, this, these things are constructed far away from, from initial data. Uh, it means that the foliation which is induced from a star, uh, starting from a star, would differ from the foliations on the initial data. So this is something which uh, you know, physicists should expect because uh, there is a different, the, the, there is a, uh, there is a uh, translation of the center of mass frame from the initial data to the center of mass frame of the final uh, black hole. Uh, anyway, I, I unfortunately, I don't have time to explain this, but uh, I'll stop. And if people ask questions, I'll say, I'll, I'll answer.
Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I guess I... Uh, sorry, there, there is a second... Yeah. Maybe it's a wild question, but uh, you know, all your work is hyperbolic, at least today. Uh, is it conceivable that ultra-hyperbolic situation could be affordable? Or, uh, can you say anything about this situation? Can you reduce ultra-hyperbolic to hyperbolic? Or what is the global picture? To, to reduce what? The, the ultra-hyperbolic equations to hyperbolic. Oh. Uh, I'm not sure what you mean. You said more than one time, everything breaks down. More than one family one or ultra ultra ah, more than time, more than one time direction. Oh, okay. So you have two pl two so two minuses two and, and, and and two pluses. Uh, no, I never really seriously thought about it, but I, I I presume that those problems are not particularly well posed in terms of. I mean, maybe you can do something analytically, but but not for uh, the kind of data that you want in physics, right? So I don't know. I think Thibault would be. Would be better to answer the question. In physics, the uh, attempts to speak about two times. Yeah. Right. Okay. So uh, I presume that there is no uh, no way to connect it to smooth data, right? You in an analytic in in the analytic category it probably makes a lot of sense, but in in the smooth category it probably doesn't. So if you want to have finite propagation speed, you will have problems, presumably. No. You have to do something different. Come for my group as two times. Right? Okay. Or yeah. two. And, but somehow the compromise symmetry is broken, so you can reduce. So is there a way to start at the conformal level? Breakdown of scale invariance is quite important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm sorry, I cannot, I cannot say more. Yeah. Other questions? Okay, so let's thank Sadio again.